All right, uh, mm -hmm. open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 10. Uh, just so that people don't get scared, it's not because I have a cold, it's because my body is extremely exhausted. So because of that, my voice is a lower voice. All right, so if it sounds like Jared, forgive me, okay? <laughs> All right, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 10. Uh, Lord willing, we will finish this chapter today. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10. All right, uh, if you recall, the whole passage is about genealogies. Uh, we covered uh, Japheth already. He is the founder. Uh, he is the one who was able to give the genealogy for the Caucasian race, and then we covered Ham. He was the one responsible concerning about the race of the black people. And then we're now covering Shem's line here. So we're about to cover Shem's line. So the rule for the Lord was that they would spread out and divide. I've explained that part already a long time ago. But then you notice the moments with Shem, Ham, and Japheth where they intermingled and then their own pagan or cultural ideologies, whatever the modern society wants to call it, they've been meshing. And so because of that, that's the reason why the Lord originally wanted them to divide. But then because he's seeing how the world is messing up again, it's repeating a pattern of Genesis 6. That's the reason why he called out Abraham. And this group was, you talk about pure like Jim Crow law, segregation or etc. That was the Jews that time. I mean, uh, rep uh, the stoning to death, all those things. Why did the Lord do that? Because that was a time of law. So it was hard, strict law where the Lord's like, okay, I've shed enough grace for 2,000, 3,000 years, actually. So about almost uh, 2,000 or over 1,000 years, I've let them abide by their conscience, freely abide by their conscience, but then they just corrupt their conscience. So then the Lord put hard and fast rules this time. But uh, before we, uh, that's a little bit of dispensationalism. I'm just giving you an overview. So, uh, before the law, it was Abraham and his children, okay, which was based on promise. So there weren't strict rules. It was just a new uh, race of people. But they needed rules, so that's why God put the law on Moses after that. So law, promise, which is Abraham, because it's all based on promise of him and his race and his children. And then right over here, before that, is government. In time of government... Uh, this is Genesis chapter 10 that we're covering. What is the time of government? The time of government, if you recall at Genesis chapter 9, was introducing certain human standards. However, Nimrod and the devil found a way around human government where there is human law, human standards, and that's a time that we're under some form of that human government but then the devil said, why don't I uh, mesh it into one world government? So then the devil corrupted God's way of setting up human government. So we're in this time period. That's the dispensation of government. Human government, age of human government that we're covering. So let's go back to the genealogies during this timeline on what happened during human government. Genesis chapter 10. We're resuming off on Ham's uh, lineage. Uh, this is found at Dr. Altman's Genesis commentary, so I'll be reading it again on page 280. Dr. Altman's Genesis commentary, and then uh, page 280. Okay, so we left off at verse 15. And Canaan begat Zidon, his firstborn. So remember, Canaan's lineage... Zidon, that's his firstborn seed. And we covered a lot about Zidon or also Zidon, Z, Zidon. And we covered a lot of interesting history over there where we covered, that's where Jezebel came out. 
around Zidon, that's where the Canaanites were able to push their Baalite, Nimrod, Semiramis religion, and then it hit further out, and then when the Phoenicians took over, there were sea trading people that spread around the world that time, or the world at their time. So then that's how Nimrod's religion spread throughout all over, through the Phoenicians. And then I taught you, which is extremely interesting, it may have been possible they, that when the sons of God and the Nephilim, when they were being pushed out and being extinguished by the Israelites from Joshua, they had to go through the furthest landmass. And there were uh, some interesting findings in Great Britain, which is why Arthurian legends continued during King Arthur's time, whereas the Roman Empire in those days, it was pretty much a nilch that time. And then South America, where we covered the Olmec culture and the, other st and the Mayans, they may have had some, uh, they ha may have had some inklings of the Nephilim culture that time because they were being pushed out further and further out of the, uh, to the furthest landmass right. near the ocean. All right, so I explained all of that last time, so that's just a brief review. Now we're covering the next son. His name is Heth. Notice that uh, when we read verse 15, Canaan begat Zidon, his firstborn, and Heth. So who is Heth? Dr. Uckman writes here, the sons of Heth are mentioned in Genesis chapter 23. So uh, you can turn over there, Genesis 23. And then I want you to go to 2 Kings 7. 2 Kings 7. Genesis 23 and 2 Kings 7. All right. Zidon. Now we come to Heth. And remember that these people, they come from Canaan. So from Ham, they went to Canaan. All right. We're going to look at 2 Kings 7. And then Genesis chapter 23. So notice that the sons of Heth, they are mentioned. We're going to look... Oh, I'm in Exodus 23. No wonder it didn't look right. All right, Genesis 23. Wait a minute here. Ah, come on. I guess I'm so weak I can't turn pages now. All right, Genesis 23. We'll notice at verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre. So notice that uh, the children of Heth, that we see them mentioned when Abraham uh, was close to their territory. Now, why are the children of Heth clo close to their territory? It's pretty obvious when you look at verse 15. Canaan, remember, gave birth to Zidon and then Heth. Now, if you read your Bible, Jezebel, being the queen of Israel that time, she came from Zidon. Uh, how was the king of Israel able to intermingle with her unless she's nearby? See? And then Abraham, he's in the land of Israel, but he's nearby the children of Heth. What's going on here? Canaan's territory right here. Um, remember, God pronounced a curse on Canaan. And then that curse is what? The Jews are going to take over his territory. His uh, descendants become servant of servants. Now, the Lord, he just don't uh, pick and choose that way. A lot of times you have to understand God does it for understandable reasons. If you read the land of Canaan, they're extremely wicked. And there was so much corruption. The Nephilim culture, they were thriving, surviving there. So then Satan's lineage was trying to revive something there, which is why the Lord had to drive them out. Uh, another example is 2 Kings. So go to 2 Kings chapter 7 and then verse 6. And then Dr. Upman says that the children of Heth, their name means terrible, okay? For some of you who want to write that down, Heth means terrible in Hebrew. And Heth is actually related to the terror of the day. And for some of you who don't know the terror of the day, they were the Hittites. So that's where uh, the Hittites would come from, is from Heth. 
If you look at 2 Kings chapter 23, uh, 2 Kings 7, excuse me, I'm mixing that with Genesis. 2 Kings 7 and verse 6. Uh, like I said, I'm totally exhausted today, so uh, just forgive me if I make some mistakes. 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us, uh, the, the, hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites. So notice that the Hittites are in the list of Egyptians and other people that the Syrians dreaded. So then the Hittites, they were a terrible people. As a matter of fact, um, uh, King David, if you know that infamous story about him committing adultery, it was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So then the Hittites, they have a lineage and they have a history with the Jews through Heth. There are several more examples if you want to write it down, but you're going to have to write it quickly about those Hittites being the terror of the day to the Jews. Judges uh, 126, Judges 126, Ezekiel 16.3, Ezekiel 16.3. All right, the next one at Genesis chapter 10 again. Let's go back to verse uh, 16. And the Jebusite. So then Jebusite is mentioned next from Canaan. Now, the Jebusites, if you recall reading the book of Exodus or the Mosaic books, uh, those, that group of people is occasionally mentioned as the enemies and the scourge of the Jews when they're conquering Canaan. So then what you read here, this is an important phrase that you probably didn't know about. You'll notice the verse says in verse 16, and the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Gergesite and the Hivite and the Archite and the Sinite. So when you look at these verses here, uh, let's keep reading onward. It says, and the Arvid, uh, Arvidite and the Zemarite and the Hamathite. So these names, why am I reading all of that? That's the name that you're going to read occasionally throughout the book of Moses. So let's just put all the tribal names. The Canaanites, okay, that's the idea. The Canaanite tribes. So then God would say to Moses, for example, you know how I drove out the Jebusite, the Archite, the Sivite, the uh, Ite, 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 Ite. As a matter of fact, because um, during that time, that's how people were known as Ites, You'll notice that Joseph Smith, when he tried to write his Book of Mormon, he tried to do that too. Like there was a group of people called Ites this and Ite that, which is a fairy tale uh, made up word. So that's where you get that idea from, the Ites, the Ites, the Ites, the Ites, and the Ites. It's from this uh, passage here, it's from the passage. Uh, very interesting is that there were some people who doubted this. They thought that it was a fairy tale, made up name, group of people, because you keep hearing too many ites, ites, and ites. But uh, one, it's got to be historical common sense that during that timeline, if groups of people are very close to each other, they're going to share similar namings. So that should be pretty obvious. Secondly, uh, one of the greatest evidences against the Bible, or so called evidences from the lost people, was the existence of the Hittites. But then, later on, they discovered too many archaeological evidences of the group of people called Hittites that they did truly exist. And as a matter of fact, the Hittites is one, one of the most uh, group of people of, of historical evidences you'll find during ancient history. So that was a Lord's sense of humor, that what used to be the best evidence against the Bible Turn out, be, turn out to be the best evidence for the Bible. All right, that's the Lord's sense of humor. Uh, some of you who took my discipleship classes, soul winning classes, I've given you a lot more examples of that too, about how the Bible proved itself to be true and then laughed at the scholars at the end. So I'm not going to do that here, but there's plenty of references. Now, this is the standard list, like I told you before, about these ites, these Canaanite tribes. And then there are several more references if you want to look them up. 
Uh, you can uh, write these down. I'm going to write it for you. So you're going to see a similar list, but then albeit sometimes some variations of the names. But you're going to see that standard list. Exodus 13, chapter 33 through 34. Deuteronomy chapter 7, chapter 20, Joshua chapter 3, chapter 12, 24. So these are the references that you can turn to on the standard for these uh, Canaanite tribes. All right, so uh, Joshua 3, Joshua 12, so that there's no confusion, all right? I'll put a semicolon here, sorry. Dr. Rutman says, uh, this is the chief ethnic subject of the Old Testament. The Jebusites, Amorite, Gergesite, Hivite, Archite, Sinai, Arvidite, Zemurite, Hamathite, that's the chief ethnic group you're going to see throughout the Old Testament. They do not need to be pinpointed in a land that is not 100 miles long. Their native boundaries are given in the next verse, which is verse 19. Okay, now you'll notice the last part of verse 18. After all these names I read out, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. So that's self-explanatory through all these names... After these people were born, their families and their lineages became part of Canaanites, and they spread abroad throughout their region. So that's what the Jews were off, up against. Now, the Jewish land, you'll notice, is verse 19. But it's the border of the Canaanites, remember. But then recall that the Lord, uh, he, uh, he conquered their land, so then it became his land. And the border of the Canaanites was from Zidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. So that is the boundary line and the dwelling place of the Canaanites. Dr. Uckman says right here that they string out from Lebanon to Beersheba, from the coastline Gaza and Gerar, to the river Jordan, and undoubtedly they were in Gilead, Bashan, uh, and Moab before Lot's children were born. So this is all the boundaries of their region. Uh, if you want to look that up in a map later on or repeat these city names, uh, it's going to be posted online. You can rewind it. Now, knowing these boundaries, here are the main cities that you want to know. You'll notice four main cities. So we covered the border of the Canaanites from Zidon all the way to Gerar and Gaza. So now we come to, as thou goest unto Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam. Now these four city names are very important later on in Genesis for some of you who didn't know that. In later Genesis studies, the, the main four cities that you're going to find out is the same four cities that God pronounced judgment on that infamous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But there were two cities that followed along with it. They were Adma and Zeboam, okay? So let me write these city names down. So you're going to see that as an example at Genesis 14, how they, uh, these cities were like teamed up together and then their culture and then their disgusting perversion and their sins that they carried on was being shared with each other. So then because of that, the Lord pronounced judgment and then just burned them to the ground. So these are the infamous four cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam, that the Lord later burned to the ground. And we'll cover them later on when we cover Genesis chapter 14 and Genesis 19. Now, you notice that from Canaan's line, he, you've got all the bad players automatically, all right? Aside from Nimrod, I mean, Nimrod's already the uh, greatest bad apple you can find. Uh, 
from Ham's line. But then Canaan, you already see all the bad guys here that the uh, Jews, that they had to be in conflict with later on. So then here's something that's interesting is, um, I don't know if I, uh, I don't recall if I taught this before, but um, I think I did. But let me just say this as an interesting reference. If you look at all these names here, uh, why is it that from Ham's line there were so many uh, bad apples coming out? Because you have to go back to what happened between Ham and Noah. When Ham did something with Noah, I pointed out it is very similar to what Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Now, if you're open, I'm not saying it's a fact, but if you're open to the idea that Satan did something uh, with Eve, and uh, it, may, it may have been sexual, but it, not, it may not be how we deem sex to be, okay? Sometimes plants, when they intermingle or stuff like that, sometimes people will call that as a sexual encounter, right? So Satan, he may have done something like that. I don't know. But then th there's something in there that he did something with Eve, and then the same indication is given with Ham. And then that would explain why, from Ham's line, that's why the devil would choose his lineage for a lot of the bad players to come out. Why? Because he may have done something with Ham. And if he did something with Ham... Think about this. Uh, why were there still giants, traces of Nephilim culture from Ham's line of all, of all the lineages, right? So then the only thing that would make the most logical sense is that the devil did something with Ham back then because it's very similar to what he did with Eve. But then a second one, a second possibility to uh, why the Nephilim culture may have revived is that they may have returned again. That also may have been another explanation. A third explanation is somehow they survived the flood. And I mentioned that it, they could have flown out, flown out to outer space yeah. or maybe somewhere deep underground. Mm -hmm. Because I pointed out at Genesis chapter uh, 7 and 8 that the people who died out was the one all over the earth. So in other words, on the dry land mass. All right, but anyways, but food for thought, right? Mm -hmm. So... A lot of interesting food for thought. But this is something you want to understand why there were these famous bad guy names from Ham's line. The reason why is because it may be that Satan may have done something with Ham back then, which is why he kept choosing that side. All right. Let's go back here at Genesis uh, chapter 10. So we covered Zeboam even unto Laisha, right? Now, Laisha is an interesting place. Go to Judges 18. Judges 18. The most interesting lineage that you're going to read in Genesis chapter 10 is not Japheth and Shem. It's going to be Ham's seed. Ham's seed has way too many interesting things going on here. All right, let's go to Judges chapter 18. Big shot, famous names that you'll find out later in the Bible. You got to realize not even Shem, where the Jews came out from, uh, is not that famous in Genesis 10. You might say, why is that? Because the Jews have not been covered yet. That's why. So then uh, the intention of Genesis 10, then you're going to notice, if you're going to find out the most famous in Genesis 10, it's going to be Ham's line. Maybe that's why the Lord had to start something with Abraham. Why? Because Ham was getting all the fame that time. Why? Especially you got Nimrod. All the cultures around the world were carrying Nimrod's religion and his name in different names that they translated. All right. Now, Laisha, Dr. Rutman reads here, is probably Laish. That's what he assumes. In extreme North Palestine, near the headwaters of the Jordan, Laish, for some of you who don't recall, is the city where the tribe of Dan installs a priest called Father and endorses images as an aid to worship. All right, and that's found in Judges chapter 18. Go to verse 29. And they called the name of the city Dan. Now, if you know Dan, the Danites... They were people on the northernmost part of Israel as well. Well, those Danites do. They did something. Laish is the northernmost part, right? So let's keep reading. 
keep reading, who was born unto Israel, howbeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. See that? Verse 30, and the children of Dan set up the graven image, oh, similar to Catholicism, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests, oh, kind of, kind of like Catholicism, to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Notice that, that this pre-Catholic religion was already in place all the way. It never ended. It never ended all the way till the Babylonian captivity. That's really strange. Uh, you'll notice right here in verse... Uh, chapter 17, if you go back to chapter 17, verse 10. So what did Micah say about that priest? And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me and be unto me a what? Father and a priest. Well, um, see, pre-Catholic religion. The Catholic Church, you got to understand this. They don't just, where do they get all those stuff from, if not from the Bible? Calling him a priest? Uh, calling him a father and a graven image. You don't just get that out of thin air. If it's not from the Bible, then where is it? They got it from a pagan culture before them. It was from what? Those Danites. But where did those Danites get that idea from? They were in the northern part, most part of Israel. Well, uh, you got to recall that Laish is from Ham's line. And who's related to Ham? Nimrod and Semiramis. Nimrod and Semiramis, if you study their religion, very similar to Catholicism, Masonry, and all kinds of bad religions today that you hear about. So they got it from Nimrod's religion. All right, go back to Genesis again. Genesis. Very interesting, Genesis 10. Ham's seed is the most interesting seed to study in Genesis 10, above Shem and above Japheth. All right. So, we're covering a lot of famous names here. All right, let's look at verse 20. These are the sons of Ham. So, all of these uh, big names that you've heard, during their timeline, they were Ham's sons. After their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. Notice right here that God says, this is their family lines. All these people are according to their tongue, their language. So notice that speaking in tongues is not gobbledygook. It's different languages, all right? If a charismatic says, I speak in tongues, and you could probably point out, oh, is it a sodomite language at verse 19? Isn't that what the verse is pointing out in verse 20? It's in verse 19, the sodomite's way of language, uh, the Zeboam's way of language, Gerar, Gaza, and etc. <laughs> all right, well, anyway, it's accordingly in their countries too, these people, and in their nation. They have their own nations. <coughs> so notice right here at Genesis chapter 10 that God, he sees it when these people spread out. They were in their own territories. You notice that, right? So that was uh, throughout the Bible. And you're going to see that again at Genesis chapter 11, that these people, all these descendants knew they had to be in their territory because that's what the Lord told them to do. It was a command at Genesis 9, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, spread it out. But when he gave that command, they understood it as in their own territory. They were not supposed to be intermingling. Why is that? The reason why is when you are uh, based on human government, okay, which is at dispensation that time, you don't want to be one world. It's best that you all go in your separate territories. Why? A human government... Uh, when you go by yourself in human tradition, human knowledge, and et cetera, it's best that you're all, all in your own lanes. If we all unite, it becomes what? Today. That's what you get today. The only time that uh, believers can intermingle and become one together, we've seen that, is in the New Testament. Why is that? Because we're not based on human government. We're not based on the world's set of government. We're based on what? God's spiritual kingdom. So based on the spiritual world, that's why we can be uh, one together. But God knows when man is left to his own devices, it's best that you're all separated from each other. Why? When one troublemaker gets along with another troublemaker, you know what happens. 
You've seen your, children who's, or your child who's a troublemaker making friends with other troublemakers? What happens? It becomes a one-world flat-footed mess. Yeah. And you want to just get them all divided and segregated. Stay away from them. That's the reason why the Lord did that back then. Because he knows what mankind is capable of when left to their own human devices. So that's why you notice there's no doubt throughout the entire Bible at Genesis 10, and then you're going to find out later on at Genesis 11, and compare that with Genesis 9, the Lord wanted them all in their separate lines. And then we looked at that at Acts 17 as well. All right, but I'm not going to cover it again. It's a fresh review. All right, let's look at verse 21. Now we see right here, uh, unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber. Let me go over here now. The brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. Okay, so remember, I'm trying to explain every word in every verse that we go through so that you can understand fully because people say, you know, the Bible's too hard to understand. Well, that's the reason why church is there so that you can study the Bible and then you have a teacher of the Word of God who can teach. And then once you get, uh, and you're going to find out the Bible's not hard to understand. It's hard to understand at the beginning, but the reason why is you have not been grown in it. You have not studied much into it. That's why it's so important we encourage people to keep coming to church, to a Bible-believing church. Not just a church that gives little ditty verses, but a church that actually teaches you the Bible. So that's the reason why we try to do that. So I try to explain every word to you. And then what's going to happen, give it about six months or a year or maximum uh, even two, you're going to get the language and the wording of the Bible after that. And then you'll find out it's super easy. Okay? All right. So let me explain every word. All right? So also Shem had sons. That's why it says unto Shem also. Uh, copycatting uh, from Ham by context. He had children as well, and he became a father of all the children of Eber. Now we come to uh, the main person that the Lord sees as very important to him. This is the lineage that he chose when the Jews later came out. And this was from Shem's line. Then from Shem's line, we see Eber. So Eber is born. I'm going to show you some interesting things concerning about the Shemites. So then he's uh, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. So Shem is Japheth's brother. And notice that Japheth is older than Shem. See that? All right, so before you white people say you're older than me, you know, don't say that, all right? I'm your pastor. And as your pastor, I'm your elder, remember? So just a joke, uh, just a joke. Okay, then. All right, but let's keep reading here. Even to him were children born. So, obviously, that's saying even Shem, that he had children born from his lineage. The children of Shem, verse 22, Elam and Asher and Arphaxad and Lud and Aram. All right, let's cover each and every name, right? All right, so here we go with each and every name, and you want to write all of this down, who they are and uh, what each name means. Okay, the first person right here from uh, Eber, he means beyond the river, okay? And what's very important, you can look at Joshua 24 too, all right? But his name means beyond the river. Now, before we cover this uh, Tower of Babel, this ziggurat shape, the Tower of Babel, we're covering all these different names, so... And then let's see how they collide later on over here when we come to Genesis 11. But Eber means beyond the river. And you're going to quite find out a lot of times when the Bible talks about the river, you'll know what it's referring to. So we can see what the river is obviously meant in Joshua chapter 24 and then verse 2. Joshua, he covers the territory of their land. And then he says here, And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood. In old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So we see right here that God calls it the river. Uh, now, if you look at Revelation, there is a certain river that's mentioned. 
at Revelation 19. And then that's the Euphrates River. Now, when people keep saying the river, the river, during their timeline, it's going to be pretty obvious. If you're going to think about the main river during their timeline of the Jews that carried on all the way to Revelation and even today, the most important river that you can think of that's in the Israelites' territory would be the Euphrates. So then we can guess where Eber went, right? So then when he looked at this river before it was called Euphrates, he was like, this is the river right here. And then that's where he resided. So that's what we know about Eber. His name means beyond the river. It also means a shoot or sprout. So it means a shoot or a sprout. Um, Shem is given a territory east of the Euphrates. This would include Mesopotamia, Babylon, Persia, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and on eastward. So that's on page 285. So notice right here that when we cover the Arabic culture, that uh, they, are, they have a bloodline of Semites. And then I covered to you last time, when we covered Ham's lineage, that they have a lineage traced to Africa or Ham's lineage as well. So what they are is a mingling. Now that's normal in Shem's line because remember that we covered uh, uh, Asher, if I recall from memory. You'll notice right here in verse 22, Asher, right? He was, uh, Shem was going to uh, Ham's area. And then uh, we see there, there was intermingling. That was inevitable. There was always intermingling going on during the BCs. Why? Because when people spread out, uh, you'll note that's the reason why God had to start a brand new race through Abraham. Okay, even though he spread them out, they were intermingling and the Nimrod's culture was being carried on. Okay, so then we see a lot of the Arabic culture covered from uh, Shem's line as well. If we keep reading onward, Elam is uh, the children of Shem that we're going to cover at verse 22. The children of Shem, Elam. Elam means youth, okay? All right, so you want to write all these down. This is all of the Arabic or even the Muslim culture that you can think of that time. You're going to see all these big names from uh, Shem's line. All right, let's cover them. The children of Shem. So when we cover the children of Shem here, let's see. Put these names up. Elam. His name means youth. And then uh, signifies the Persians who settled around modern day Iraq now. Next one, Asher. Asher. Remember, he was the ancestor of the Assyrians. So, Assyria. Very interesting, these Assyrians, the uh, Bible points out that uh, the Egyptians were Assyrians, that they shared a similar culture. And then that's the reason why Egyptian, you'll notice a little bit, uh, even though it's in the region of Africa, there is Semitic uh, inklings of culture, you'll notice. All right, because there was a mingling that time. But that's a whole new story. That's, if you remember intermediate discipleship, that's the reason why uh, the Egyptians hated the shepherds. Why? Because the shepherds, they came from the Assyrian line who took over Egyptians that were known as shepherd kings. And then the Assyrians took over Egypt that time. And then when Moses came out, that's why they hate. Uh, and that's why they hated shepherds later on. But anyway, that, that's, a whole, that's a whole thing, all right? If you remember your intermediate discipleship, that was very interesting to learn. Okay, but uh, continuing on, our fact said. All right. Our fact said, settles near Asher dwells in the northern parts of Assyria, near Armenia, intermingling with Tubal and Meshach. It's near Armenia. Next one, Lud, inhabitants of uh, ancient uh, I'm not going to write their region because I'm running out of space. Uh, Eastern Asia Minor, who became intermingled with Meshach and Riphath. Intermingled with Meshach and Riphath. 
Again, you can rewind this video if you want to write those names down. Aram. Hebrew means the highland, the highland. Arameans and Aramaic are derivations, okay? Uh, the reference is to the Syrians west of the Euphrates River, who became mixed with Canaanites and descendants of Heth. Uh, the next one, the children of Aram now. We're going to cover them. Verse 23, children of Aram, Uz and Hol and Gether and Mash. All right, Uz. Why is that interesting? There was a man who lived in the land of Uz. All right, Job chapter 1, verse 1. That's Job. All right, that's the reason why. So Job came from there. The famous founder of the land of Uz, where Israel will take refuge in the tribulation. Now, Dr. Upman mentions that in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21, which is interesting. Lamentations 4, 21. That's the place where Israel will take refuge in the tribulation. Y'all turn over there. Now, the word, it means firmness. It means firmness. Uz is basically the Edom of biblical times. And then what is now Jordan? That's what it is. So the Jordanians, they came from over here. All right. Okay, so this is where Job came from when you look at Job's 1.1. 1, 1. But then let's look at a tribulation inkling here at Lamentations chapter 4. And then uh, we'll look at verse 21. The word of God reads, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, right? That dwellest in the land of where? Uz. So see, that's why Edom uh, comes from Uz. And that's why the Bible pronounces, if you read your Bible about Edom, that the Jews, they flee over there. They flee to the land of Edom. Okay, continuing onward. <coughs> Excuse me. Hul, the next uh, person. Uh, Oz and Hul. Hul, uh, Hebrew means circle. So his name means circle. Dr. Upman's not sure about his location. He says uh, Armenia and Western Syria are given locations. Armenia and Western Syria. So one of those two or maybe in between. The next one is Gether. Gether. Dr. Upman writes here unlocated, so he doesn't know about Gether. So, uh, yikes, okay. He doesn't know about Gether. He doesn't know about Mash. That's the next son, right? You read there. Selah, he doesn't know where either. But he can give you the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word means extension. It means extension. Next one is uh, Eber, who is a son of Selah. All right. So remember, verse 21, unto Shem also the father of all the children of what? Eber, right? So then Eber is not just born just like that from Shem. What happens is that he comes out all the way from a line, from Elan, Asher, Aphrixad, Lud, Aram, and then from Aram's line, see? From Aram, then he goes to Uz, Hul, and Gether, and Mash. And then Arphaxad begat Selah. So it's from Arphaxad at verse 22. That's where Eber came, comes from. Selah begat Eber. Okay, so where Eber comes from then is going to come from Arphaxad. Nearby Armenia, maybe. Now, why would God cover Eber? Eber is very important for the two mainstream of Semites that you would think about. So a lot of people, when they talk about uh, the Asian community, they include the Pacific Islanders over there because of the, they claim about the stereotype thinking. 
And then, but basically they did admit something right here. There is a main thinking what they, what people know about. When they think about mainly about Asian community, they mostly concentrate on the Orient, right? So then when you're thinking about Semites, you're thinking about the Orient, but then you're also thinking about Jews as well. So then uh, you're going to go, how in the world do two different people come out that way? And they all come from Sem, uh, Shem. So then that, uh, that always uh, made me wonder. So that's why there are people who will say that the Orient, it comes out from Japheth, they'll argue. Uh, and then from Shem, that's where you would get the Jews. But me, I believe that the, uh, the people from the Orient, that they come from Shem. And the Jews also come from Shem. Why? Because the Lord already gave you a clue, a very important person you have to pay attention to, Eber, okay? Why did the Lord specifically mention his name? Because something happened with him, okay? When Eber came out. All right, so here's the, some of the interesting things that you want to read. Okay, go to Genesis 10. Here's the interesting part. Verse 25, all right? We covered that so far, right? And unto Eber were born two sons. So now we come to Eber. He had two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. So Peleg had, uh, so Eber had a son named Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. So when Eber had a son, one was Peleg. And his brother's name was Jokten. And then he had another one named Jokten. All right. So then when we come from Eber here. We see Peleg and then a brother named Jokten. Now, Jokten, he can either come, uh, Jokten could either be Eber's brother or Peleg's brother. I don't know. But the point is, Eber is the important person. Let's say for now, from Eber is two people, okay? So let's just say that for now. So then, Jokten and Peleg. Now, Peleg, it's pretty obvious. If you read Chronicles and then you read the book of Luke from Peleg, this is where you get the Jewish descendants. But then if Joktan is the brother, this is where the Orient comes from. Now, you might say, where was that split? Well, the Bible already told you. For in Peleg's day, look at that verse again. In his days, Peleg was called so because the earth was divided. That's when there was a split coming out. So because of that, Peleg, Peleg obviously split from his brethren. And they were spreading out. They were divided. So you can guess during his time also is when God put that confusion of the Tower of Babel and spread them all out. So you could guess right here that it was at that time. So then when the Tower of Babel hit, it did something with uh, Eber's line here. And then what happened is there was a split. And the Jewish descendants carried on to uh, the western part and then the eastern part, uh, Jokten. That's where you get China, Korea, Japan, and those other people. Now I'm going to show you why that's going to be the case for Jokten. One is because of, uh, I believe that it has to come from Shem, not Japheth. That's reason number one. You might say, why from Shem, not Japheth? Because the Bible says that uh, Japheth's de uh, descendants shall be enlarged. And then he's going to dwell in the tents of Shem. That's a prophecy. If you're going to look at throughout history, uh, which of the three main sociological groups that I pointed out, which is Caucasian, black, and then uh, the mongoloid, if you look at these three, um, which group out of those three are the ones who grew so much that they colonized and dwelled, dwelled in other people's places? They even dwelled in Shem's tent. So that's pretty obvious. That's concerning the Caucasian side. So then that makes way more sense. Not only that, the Shemites were the ones uh, the, like the Native Americans, for example, and then even the Orient itself, where uh, the white people colonized and dwelled in their territories. So there's no doubt about that one. 
Uh, a second thing is this. A second thing is when we look at this text, look at verse uh, 26 now. And Joktan begat Almadad, and Sheleph, and Hazar Maveth, and Jera, and Hadoram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abimael, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling was from Mesha. All right, so they were in the territory of Mesha. All right, I'll cover those uh, uh, names a little bit later on, but then the more important part is this po point at verse 30. They were at Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. One reason is because of verse 30. Joktan, he was pushing toward east. That's why. So then opposite from Peleg, remember they're supposed to be divided. If Peleg, which is a Jew, stayed in that area, and then Joktan was going east, why that's pretty obvious then. See, it's going toward the Orient area. So obviously that would come from Shem, that would not come from Japheth because of the scripture. So their dwelling was from Misha, and as they went to Sephar, Dr. Upton says at page 287, Misha supposedly is the support of Maza at the mouth of the Tigris River, with Mount Sephar being a reference to Zephar, uh, or Defari on the coast of the Hadramut. This would locate the migrations into what is now modern Iran. So during that territory where a lot of the Arabic culture came from. Another reason why I would argue that the Asians or the Orient came from uh, Joktan is because even scientifically, if you look at the migrations of genetics, and you can even do a simple Google search, and there are a lot of um, professional societies, scientific communities who research the traces of our ancestry. It's so interesting, they try to go back to Africa where they try to proclaim modern day Lucy, you know, a hominid fossil. But the arrows are very few in number that they show in migration. But you know where they show most of the migrations coming from? Babel. There's no way you can deny that. They know that was the heart and the center. That just proves your Bible. There's too many arrows going out of Babel. And it's so funny how they try to get like one or three arrows out of Africa where they found that evolution fossil for Lucy. The reason why they do that is because they don't want to believe in God. They want to believe that we came from monkeys, right? So then they named this one uh, monkey Lucy. But anyway, aside from that, the pointer is, is that it all came from Babel. And then when you look at the migration arrows, it goes from Babel all the way to China. And then what they do is that they go upward to Siberia, and then they go to China. There's another arrow that goes from uh, the Iraq, Iranian region down to India, and then some of them going up to China, and then to Korea. And then, uh, because I did my uh, doctorate paper on Korea, it was very fascinating. We either came from Siberians, or we came from a lower part where they ca carried on from the Arabic culture to India, to China, to Korea. But I lean more towards Siberia. There's more scholars referring to Siberian region. That's where shamanism was born. It was Siberia. And then that's why Korea carried on that culture for over a millennia, shamanism. But then Buddhism, you know, that it was introduced. And then Korean Buddhism is very unique from uh, India's way of Buddhism and other cultures. Why? Because we mingled Korean shamanism with Buddhism that time. And then here's another thing. Korean Christianity today, it's based off of shamanism Buddhism. So then all you get about that speaking of tongues and then all that stuff, that may come from charismatic doctrine, but they... If you study your history, Yonggi Cho, who was mainly the one who sprouted that, he adapted some things that match with uh, Korean pagan culture, with his uh, doctrine. That's why his church became the world's largest church. You know how you become the world's largest church? Simple. You compromise. You intermingle with your culture of that time that's pagan. That's how you grow a big church. You know how you don't grow a big church? It's easy. Don't compromise with the culture. Your church will be small, all right? It's that simple. Okay. Now that we uh, understand the history, it also makes sense about the Native Americans. Because if you study about the genetic line, uh, you get some people then 
from Mongolia, then to Korea, and then some parts to Japan, but then other people going up north. And then if there was not that much water that time and the land masses were closer, then they could have crossed and then went up through North America. Then from North America, they came to South America. So then that's how all the culture came from. That's why Native Americans and then the Asians and then the Jews, we all share the same bloodline from Shem, you have to understand. The reason why the Jews today, a huge number of them, you'll see them as most, uh, mostly look like white people is because of they were wanderers that time. So remember, they were wanderers, so obviously they had to reside and intermingle with the city and the culture that they lived in that time. And then uh, you obviously get the Holocaust coming out of Germany. Why? There were a lot of Jews who resided there that time. All right. Uh, that's why we get the idea Ashkenazi Jews, right? Because we covered Ashkenaz from uh, Japheth's line and etc. Okay. It's interesting, our history here. Uh, interesting thing. If you look at the Hebrew of Genesis 10.30, a mount of the east, if you uh, transliterate, not translate, but just transliterate, uh, almost, it's a near transliteration of Hebrew, it would be a mount of the orient, actually. So that's where J uh, Joktan's descendants were pushing toward, which is extremely interesting. Now, with all these names that I read, uh, briefly, from verse 26 through 29. Okay, let's go back behind verse 30. 26 through 29. I covered all those names, right? Dr. Upman simply writes here this. This is the only information that we can find out about them. And then I have to wrap it up now. There is general agreement that all the sons of Joktan are Arabians. They settle in Arabia proper and spill over into Ur, Chaldea, and thence to the west side of the Persian Gulf. They are the Yemens, uh, Chaolan, Jobab, uh, Jobabite, Hadramite, and Hadramauts of Arabia. Some of them go as far east as India. Ophir, which you see that mentioned in your Bible, right? Ophir, right there at verse 29. It's mentioned in your Bible from Solomon, in Solomon's kingdom. It's the famous place for gold, and it is probably in India, not Arabia. The scholars differ on locations. And then he mentions Josephus, Vitringa, Jacinius, and Delich. They all favor India. But like I told you before, if you look at that genetic map, uh, that's where the Orient and the Asians come from, which is extremely interesting. All right. So next Sunday, we're going to cover the most interesting incidents and story, the Tower of Babel. And... I'm going to show you something interesting. It's very possible they weren't just building a high tower to try to reach up to the skies. They were probably trying to do something more. Basically, Satan's trying to revive Genesis 6. All these strange things, what he did with Eve and then Ham and then Genesis 6, you got to realize that Satan was always trying to do something weird. It's going to be very eye-opening when you see that. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. I pray today's teaching have been a blessing to the hearers and made us understand every word from your precious book. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.